I'm Beth Blostein, the architecture section head here at the Knowlton School of Architecture. Um, the theme of this lecture series is practice. And this theme seemed uh, fitting from a number of perspectives. Um, perhaps the most straightforward um, is that part of what the three sections here at the KSA do is to prepare students for the professional pursuit of a discipline, to professionally practice. More generally, though, practice sits um, in a reciprocal position to what we call the discipline. Um, discipline critiques and theorizes, while practice tests and applies. Um, together, when they are not at each other's throats, new knowledge is born. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, we're all aware that today there are profound pressures put on all practices, from the extremes of the economic situation to the environment. Within academia, we feel those same pressures. Tools for design, fabrication, and analysis are evolving rapidly, which impacts the disciplinary practices that students undertake to become proficient and adept with the language of design. Within this series of the next several months, we will see many who practice. Some are propelled despite and even inspired by these pressures. Bernadette Hanlon, Ignacio Bunster, John Ronan, Georgine Theodore, Eric Owen Moss, Jonathan Barnes, and Pai Sahe Samarhentes. The series reopens after spring break with Thomas Christofferson, partner of BIG, one of the youngest and yet most prolific contemporary practices um, as evidenced by the drawing styles that many of you have adopted. We will see others who practice in completely new ways. Benjamin Ball of Ball Nogue Studio, our own Karen Lewis, and Lefebvre Fellow Brandon Clifford. Which brings us to tonight's lecture. Um, perhaps in a moment of irony, the practice lecture series is being opened by someone who is not an architect, a landscape architect, or a planner, but is a structural engineer. If discipline and practice are often at odds, one could argue that for centuries, architecture and engineering have often been even more contentious bedfellows. But conditions in our world have changed since the practice of architecture was institutionalized. Design work is done for clients that will never be seen who may have completely different cultural values. Building types have multiplied, many with specific and complicated technical demands. All of these changes have exerted pressure to redefine the practice either by increasing the depth and sophistication of knowledge or adding to it. Enter Guy Nordenson. Traditionally, it's the architect, we like to believe, who brings in a structural engineer to provide specific expertise. Guy's collaborative method of working re-engineers this model of practice to structurally examine the world we are practicing in. From his seminal publication, Tall Buildings, Reexamining the Typology After a Century of Massive Innovation, to a design and research exhibition at MoMA, Rising Currents. His lens is visionary and provocative. Recently, he authored Patterns and Structures, which locates his body of work specifically and the disciplines of architecture and engineering in general within a broader cultural discourse. There simply isn't enough time to outline as many achievements to date, but Guy has collaborated with some of the greatest designers of our time, Hull, Sana, OMA, Moss. As further testament, Nordenson was the first recipient of the American Academy of Arts and Letters Academy Award in Architecture for contributions to architecture by a non-architect. In 1987, he established the New York office of O'Verapin Partners and was its director until 1997 when he began his current practice. Nordenson has since served as a structural engineer on many of the projects that will define the architectural landscape of this decade. The Nelson Atkins Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art, and Linked Hybrid in Beijing. He is also a professor of architecture and structural engineering at Princeton University. And I would like to thank the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geodetic Engineering for co-sponsoring tonight's lecture. This wouldn't have been possible without both their interest and contribution. And along these lines, I've been asked to let those engineers in the audience who are in need 
Um, there are PDH certificates available after the lecture, and I think that's the first time I've ever made that announcement. And with that said, it's an extreme honor to introduce Guy Nordenson. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, this um, talk is uh, sort of a survey of work uh, over the last number of years in the context of this book that Beth mentioned that I published um, uh, last year called Panders and Structure, which was a compilation of, of, of writings over the years and gave me an opportunity to, to think a little bit about what might be the underlying um, consistency or, or theme in, in this work, both um, engineering work and, and other projects that I've been involved in. And the, 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 the duality, if you will, in the title, Patterns and Structure, is something that I've seen um, <clears throat> in my experience in my work in um, various projects come up many, many times. And it's, it's essentially a duality in, in some ways between surface appearance, um, what sometimes in architecture is ornament, um, and structure as something that is um, uh, associated maybe with physical laws or associated with underlying patterns or underlying structures which are not necessarily uh, apparent in, in, in the surface. If you like, it's the same old um, distinction that, that Chomsky made between surface structure and deep structure and that recurs many, many ways and, and, and in different situations. And I think as an engineer, um, it's definitely it's something that comes up over and over again in the relationship between, uh, in many cases, ornament and structure, but in other cases, um, the, the, the circumstances and, and, and ideas um, emerging in the beginning stages of an architectural project and what uh, engineering, in particular, structure has to offer um, to that project. So a lot of this has to do with the patterns of collaboration and the ways in which collaboration, um, in a sense, is is constantly having to do with, with emerging patterns um, themselves. One of the terms that, that I've um, found captures a certain aspect of this for me from a historical perspective is one that, that Ezra Pound um, used very often, which is um, the vortex. Um, Pound used it as a um, um, characterization of historical moments for him where there were unusual convergence of, of interests and talent and, and, and historical circumstances that led to something very special. And for me, uh, what is uh, often of greatest interest is to find a way to be in the midst of and participating in a situation that is, is unique in that historical sense. Uh, Pound would point to the, the Tempio Malatesta in Rimini as one of the great moments um, in, in Renaissance architecture uh, where an extraordinary and complex client, Sigismundo Malatesta, brought Alberti to Rimini to convert uh, an existing Franciscan church, um, which you can see actually um, the remains of behind the, the wrapper um, that Alberti put on it. And Alberti, in turn, brought into this project a large number of extraordinary artists of a contemporary of his, uh, Piero La Francesca, um, Duccio, um, and many others, the Lombardi brothers, um, many others who, who, who had all been working independently and who Alberti brought into the project to do individual um, pieces um, inside. This is a fresco that Piero de, uh, de La Francesca did of the coronation of Sigismundo Malatesta. Um, and there are many other ways in which this building actually celebrates uh, a man, which also was uh, a first um, at that point in, in the Renaissance, a church that is, is, was as much about a person as it was about, about God. And I think for, for Pound, this had a particular importance because 
Here you had, you know, patronage of, uh, of, of a highest order in the sense that, you know, for example, Malatesta, when Alberti was asking him to get access to some stone that was in a quarry in a, in a, in a neighboring um, place, which he didn't control, just sent his army over there to capture the quarry so that um, Alberti could get uh, the stone that he wanted. So, you know, what every architect um, is looking for in a, in a, in a patron. Um, <laughs> the uh, more, more contemporary example that I'm very fond of is the Phillips <laughs> Pavilion that Le Corbusier did with Finakis. Um, I have to be careful here in my, my story with Jose, uh, but I, so I don't get it wrong, but what I know is from Mark Tribe's book on, on this project, it was a, a temporary pavilion that was built for the Expo in Brussels. Um, the initial partie sketch that, that Corb did um, started from a notion of how the, the, um, the public was brought into this space and, and had the experience, um, it was a, very much a multimedia experience um, with projections and movies and lights and even this platonic sculpture that Corb hung inside. And then they would emerge the other end, um, a, a, a kind of digestive experience. Um, uh, Corb described this as, as, a, as a stomach. And then with Xenakis, um, they developed a three-dimensional um, development of that idea, which, which was based on what at the time was quite a popular um, interest uh, in, in shells. And, and in this case, the possibility of a shell or a, a curvilinear form that was somehow generated from, from a tensile membrane. And so these were study models that Xenakis did for that. Uh, during a period when, sorry, during a period when um, Le Corbusier was back and forth to, to India. And so actually Xenakis had a very strong hand in this, in the authorship of the project. And in the end, there was some contentious, um, uh, contention between him and Corb over that, that, that um, authorship, which is well documented in Mark Tribe's book. The transient nature of the project, the fact that it was a temporary pavilion, the complex relationship between Korb and Sanakis, and beyond that even, the way in which it was finally constructed. Um, they went through a number of different efforts to find a way to build this. It, it was, in the end, not a shell. It wasn't a tension structure. It had to be made um, out of thick panels of concrete. There was a very um, involved process of getting from that initial conception to the, to the final execution, which brought in lots of very um, capable, talented people who are all, all celebrated in Mark's book, but all add to the complexity and, I think, uniqueness of this project. It's not like any other project that Corb did, um, probably in part due to Xenakis's hand, but also, I think, due to the uniqueness of that, of that situation. A number of years later, um, uh, an engineer named Billy Kluver, who had been instrumental in the, in the art and technology movement in, in Los Angeles, um, uh, had the opportunity to build this pavilion at the Expo in, in Osaka. Um, there's now this wonderful book that Rem Koolhaas put together on the Metabolist, which has great documentation of this um, Expo. It was really an extraordinary number of different um, projects in that expo. Um, this one in particular involved a collaboration with Robert Rauschenberg and a number of other artists who had been involved with Billy Kluver in, in his experiments and in the development, actually, of, of, of a number of happenings. This geometric pavilion, which actually in plan is a lot like Corb's um, Phillips Pavilion, had the same notion of bringing people in, ejecting them out, having this geometric form, um, in this case shrouded in mist, um, as this um, representation of a confluence of talent and confluence of, of, of influences. Um, even more recently, to me, one of the most extraordinary projects, both as architecture but also from a historical standpoint, is the Menil in Houston of Renzo Piano, uh, because of, again, the number of influences that have conver that converged on this project. Um, it wasn't only Piano, but also, of course, the engineers involved, Peter Rice, Tom Barker, the mechanical engineer, Rice, the structural engineer, who developed with Piano these ferrous cement leaves and ductile iron um, trusses, but also the Menil, who brought 
the ideas for the project, the notion that there would be this treasure house storing the art above the exhibition space, that there would be a lot of light, that work would be constantly cycling through the space, all of, the, all of which were ideas that had been developed earlier with Louis Kahn when he did a first scheme for this project. So you had the influence of Kahn brought to the project. You had the influence of Philip Johnson, who had done a house for the Dominios that included interior gardens and other elements um, that he, in turn, had brought from, from Mies. And then from the art side, you had Pontus Hilton, who was a um, very important um, museum director, ran the Pompidou for a while, um, and eventually went on to the Louisiana Museum in, in Denmark, and Walter Hopps, who brought, um, uh, who brought Duchamp for the first time to America at the Pasadena Museum. So the more you expand the field in this project, the more you realize that this is an extraordinary and unique situation which, in effect, the building is a manifestation of, a kind of cultural uh, vortex, um, which I think is part of why everyone has the strong feelings that they do um, about the project, including the people involved. I think what happens with these kinds of projects is that, in retrospect, they are, for everyone who's had a part in it, um, unique in their, in their life uh, experience. Um, one aspect of that, I think, is the approach that Rice and Piano took of saying that each project was an opportunity to experiment with materials. They would start a project by saying, what if we did this with Ferris Cement and Dr. Lyron? Let's see how that um, leads us into a particular um, situation. So lots of experimental aspect, but also lots of extraordinary convergences. Now, part of this to me, and it, it does go back in a way to the literary um, aspect of this is that when you start to think about buildings in this way, you start to also look at them um, as opportunities for close reading and as opportunities for um, uh, revealing, in a sense, um, or discovering the, the idiosyncrasies and ambiguities and sometimes contradictions that are embedded in, um, in these projects. And from my standpoint as a structural engineer, it gets quite interesting when you start to go back into the photographs of construction and the correspondence, um, in this case with Mises Crown Hall at IIT, it's a lot of very good um, documentation in the archive at, at MoMA, so you can read the correspondence between the engineer and Mies and between the engineer and the contractor and look at the construction photographs and begin to understand how there are these quirks in the way in which Mies chose to, to develop this architecture, which really affected the, 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 the circumstances and, and, and resolution of the project. The first one is the fact that these girders that support the roof are standing proud of the roof, and yet, as they span across the roof, are bending in such a way that the top cord of those girders in compression wants to buckle to the side, a phenomenon called lateral torsional buckling where if you don't hold the top flange of a beam, at some point it will roll over. And the contractor was actually very concerned about this and wrote a letter to me saying, I am not going to build this because it isn't safe. These girders are going to roll over, they're going to buckle, this is just not okay. Um, Kornacker, the, engi the engineer, Frank Kornacker, who was working with Mies, wrote back and explained patiently that, in fact, there were rigid moment connections down here between the purlins, which in turn tied into these stiffeners, which from below restrained that top flange and kept it from buckling. And he pointed out that there were many through girder rail bridges that are built that way, and so on and so forth. But there is a, 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 a visible risk. Um, to a certain person's viewpoint that was already embedded in, in, in the design. The other aspect, um, to me, has to do with these, these mullions. Um, if you look at the facade, you, you know, see, see very clearly that you have these primary columns that are supporting the girders, but then in between them you have a string of, of, of mullions that are also wide flange sections which run around the building. Clearly they're secondary, and part of the curtain wall. 
But if you go back, let's just go back to the slide, if you then start to realize that when you get to the end here, the fact that this girder is pulled back from the edge suggests that that edge is cantilevering, sort of like wings floating off, off, off a plane. But if you go and look closely at the detail here, you realize that, that because it's welded here, in fact, is being supported by, by the mullion. If you will, no big deal, but, but if you're going to go to the trouble to, to work with structure as your mode of representation, it then becomes important, I think, that there are these intrinsic contradictions and distortions in that, in that logic. Um, so again, when you look at the detail of how these are attached to the fascia, which is also steel, they're welded and in fact participating as much as part of the structure as this guy. It just happens this is supporting a girder, this is supporting the fascia, but it's taking part of the roof load as much as anything else. So that primary secondary notion isn't quite so clear as it might appear. Now, I would argue that that ambiguity between the primary and secondary structure and the very strong reading of the girders at, at, at the roof is all part of another kind of ambiguity which has to do with the legibility of that hierarchy on the outside of the building and the invisibility of that hierarchy on the inside of the building. So when you go from the outside to the inside, you go from clearly organized and hierarchical structure to what appears to be a very uniform, very thin and consistent structural expression all around where ultimately it's just the light, in, if you will, that's holding up, up the roof. So I think all of those nuances are ultimately important in understanding what, in my view, was in the mind of Nice in manipulating these cues to get to a certain effect, which was that from the inside, the structure disappears. There's a similar um, situation, I think, with the Beinecke Library at, at Yale by Gordon Bunshaft. Um, it is, like many of these other projects, I think, unique in the career of, of the architect. Um, this is for a rare book collection, and it's designed um, to, to, to look like a jewel box, if you like, supported on the corners here by these little, these columns here, which are clad in, in stone, and, um, and opaque to, from, from the outside. Um, the structure is, uh, made, was designed by Paul Weidlinger, and is made up of a grid on the outside of box um, columns and beams that are triangular in section and taper um, regularly to the to the midpoint. So they're deeper at the cross sec at the intersection here, and then they taper in both directions. And you kind of see that from from the shadow line. That represents the moment distribution in the in the Virendale, which is spanning from corner to corner, or actually not from corner to corner, from inside corner right here, set back from the corner to the inside point on the other side. So the structure is, is on the outside, clearly expressed in the geometry, though not so muscular, um, and, and tapered in a way that is directly representative of what's happening to it structurally. Now, even though it's on the perimeter, the column is pushed back from where it intersects. So the volumetric expression of where those supports are is contra contradicting really what is going on structurally, but it's right. It wouldn't look good if this was actually under the corner. And actually there's a building at Cornell that he did with a similar um, system where the column is at the face and it looks a lot clumsier than, than, than this does. So there are decisions about the, the anomalies in the structure, if you will, that are key to the overall success of, of the design. From the inside, the other thing, like in Mies, Mies's um, building, is that the structure completely dematerializes. You can't really tell that this is structure. It looks like a screen. It looks like you're looking at a curtain wall, but then you don't really know where the structure is. So there is there uh, 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 an ambiguity, again, which is quite, um, quite strong. Finally, what's quite um, powerful, I think, is when you walk into this, is how much the light comes blasting in underneath, and again, how you feel like there's almost this cushion of light holding up the building. Uh, finally, in this string of, of examples is the World Trade Center, um, designed by Yamasaki with the engineer Les Robertson. And 
Um, I don't know how much you know about the structure of this, but it was, um, it was built for, for the Port Authority. The Port Authority it was an agency that had quite a little, lot of resources at its disposal, and so they, they allowed um, the architect and the engineer to develop a completely customized um, design, and Les Robertson put an enormous amount of energy into developing structure that was quite um, unique and, and custom for the, the circumstances. He, he, on the perimeter of the tower, developed a system made up of these clusters of columns linked by plates. Um, there were three-story trees uh, with joints happening, um, offset from one another, but happening at, at this level above the floor. Uh, the, the floor was made up of trusses, also panelized with portions of the slab. So everything was prefabricated in, in assemblies that was then brought out to the site and erected, as you can see. This is a piece of, of slab going in place. Um, this is the grid of the perimeter structure. This is a tube structure, so all the structure is concentrated in the perimeter um, to give it the greatest possible stiffness and strength. And everything was, was, um, was both um, unitized prefabricated and, and fit and customized specifically for its, its situation and, and need. Now, um, after 9-11, one of the things that, that, that we discovered looking at the drawings of the building, um, which I knew about but I'd never quite understood in, in that level of detail, was that Robertson had, had also used a large variety of steels in making this, um, this structure. In fact, 14 different types of steel. And so while you could look at this facade and see uh, a similarity in, in the geometry and a similarity in the system, maybe with increasing plate thicknesses and so on, underlying that was a huge variety in, in steel type. And um, that was, in fact, the, the, the main focus of, of his creative energy. So, so we mapped that on this drawing. This is an unfolded elevation of one of the towers and then the other tower here. And we mapped the type of steel on the elevation to see what that looked like and try to understand what, um, what it meant. So these are the types of steel from the low strength 36 KSI to high strength 100 KSI, which came from Japan. A lot of these high strength steel came from Japan. These are the geometric types of elements that, that made up the, the facade. And there, as you go around, you start to see that he's using high strength steel, the, the red stuff, in the corners and the lower strength steel in the middle of, of each facade. Now, part of that has to do with the demand on the building from the wind, given the fact that the buildings are uh, positioned relative to another in a particular way and facing the particularities of the wind environment, which is not symmetrical. Um, the, the highest hurricane winds tend to come in from the northeast. The regular winds that come in with storms come from the northwest. So for different kinds of, of extreme winds, you're dealing with different directionality. Plus, the city is on one side, the water is on the other side, and the two buildings are positioned relative to another in a particular way. So in the wind tunnel studies that they did, they, un they incorporated and integrated all that information in pressures on, maximum pressures on the building. But the other thing that um, Robertson did was compensate for a phenomenon called shear lag, which is the tendency in this kind of gridded tube frame for the forces to linger uh, near the corners. There's, if you look at the distribution of forces in one of these tubes, there tends to be more force um, acting near the corner than in the, in the middle of each face. And that's um, simply a function of the fact that there's so many holes. So it doesn't really behave like a tube. It behaves like a tube, but, but, but with greater concentration of stresses in the corners. What Robertson realized was that if he used a higher strength steel in the corners, he could make the elements smaller, plate thickness is smaller. By making them smaller, he could make them less stiff and by making them less stiff, shed load. So in a kind of paradoxical way, he was using the high strength stuff to make the element more flexible and thereby shedding load back to the middle, which he made bigger by using the lower strength steel. So what you see then mapped here is the environment, 
as calculated through the wind tunnel studies, plus this manipulation of those demands to get as much out of the full facade as, as he could. So extremely creative act, I think, remarkable and unique in the history of structural engineering and completely invisible. And this takes me to, I think, an important aspect of all of this, which is that, <coughs> you know, as Beth said, a lot of what happens in engineering is invisible. And one has to make a decision in doing this, and it's a decision that you make every day. How important is it to be creative in situations that are completely unknown and completely invisible? And, and there's a great quote from Longfellow, which, which Wittgenstein used quite often, which points to a certain attitude that has to do with um, making even hidden things um, uh, fantastic. So uh, let me go through a couple of projects that um, are um, from our, our, our experience that in different ways, I think, touch on some of these themes. Um, worked a number of years ago on the Museum of Modern Art with Taniguchi, um, the expansion of the museum, and the two things that are most apparent in what we did, um, there's, there's a fair amount of work in the, in the organization of the column grid and so on that, that, that we participated in, which is more subtle. But the main event is this wall, which faces the garden, which is made of steel plates that are two inches wide and seven inches deep and span 60 feet. And the point here was to try to make um, here you see them from the inside. The, the, the connections are mortise and tenon, sort of like Japanese um, carpentry, so they're, they're machined to fit together and then held with uh, a, a bolt from the outside, so as little welding as possible. And the ultimate um, consequence, I think, is a, a line um, of these mullions that from a distance looks impossibly thin, and, and that was... Um, from my perspective, a, a, a very important aspect of that, that, that if you look at it from a distance, to the eye, it seems like it should be thicker. There's something that seems slightly optically um, off about it. But other than that, it's extremely simple and straightforward in its, in its um, execution. A lot having to do, of course, with the stability of these very thin um, beams spanning um, um, such a distance. The other thing that, that, that we did was, um, uh, was to disappear a column. Um, and this was a funny story. We were working on this project, and it was starting um, sort of early stages of, of bidding. And I was in a meeting, and um, the director of the museum passed along a comment from one of the trustees that he felt that there were too many columns. Um, it wasn't more specific than that. There were just too many columns. So I, um, you know, all this trying to please, um, I went home and realized that in the way in which we had um, designed the structure, there's the, the new gallery building here, you can see in the framing elevation, and then there's a tower above with offices and, and conservation labs and mechanical room and the cooling towers on the roof. We had put a truss in around the mechanical level and up around the cooling tower to tie the core to the remaining columns so that we could add some stiffness to what was otherwise a fairly skinny um, core system. So we had this truss in place in the design, and we could, as a result, get rid of this column here in the Contemporary Art Gallery and hang these floors from above. Now, in the, in the world of, of <coughs> cost estimates and bidding, um, if, you, if you're in a situation like this and you've already bought the fabrication and erection of this truss and a certain amount of material, if all you need to do is add an incremental amount of material to that, the cost to do that is a lot less than the average cost of the steel. Um, so in order to get this truss to carry these floors, all we had to do, sorry, all we had to do was, um, was, was increase the, the amount of steel in here but that represented a small incremental cost. I think it was like five or $6,000 per column. So we could come back and say to um, the museum, we'll just get rid of this column. Well, of course, they, 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 they liked it, but they were also quite surprised that we could do this at that late 
they in the game. And so it became a bit of an urban legend. And when they were giving tours to VIPs during construction, the young man who would um, give the tour would bring um, the VIPs here as part of the tour and say, um, uh, this is where the column disappeared. Which, of course, to the visitor, you know, like, what's the point of that? Um, <laughs> but if you can imagine this, as we did this image in the, in the, in the Sarah show, um, it's a good thing. The, um, the MIT dorm um, we did a number of years ago with Stephen Hall, uh, it was a new building along Vassar Street, um, which hadn't been developed before that. And Stephen had the idea that this building would have some porosity so that it would not um, feel as if it was, it was interfering in the, in, the, in the visual relationship between the, the, the town and, and the campus. And so this idea of a sponge with big cutouts um, and the gridded character of the facade was something that Stephen started with. And we suggested that, that we could adopt that and make the structure directly from that geometry by prefabricating elements in, in concrete that would be assembled to make that up. Um, the benefit of that was that this grid then could become structural, and so in these areas where it, it cantilevered or had large cutouts, it could then span, um, span around. Um, this is a view from the inside of the, the building, and this is one of those panels coming in. So these were fabricated in Canada, in Quebec, um, and then brought to Boston and assembled, kind of like a Lego set, the uh, connection between the panels, which are actually um, three, typically three um, openings per floor, 10 feet um, floor to floor height. They were um, stitched together with poured in place concrete. So that line is a bit like a mortar line in a brick wall. And these are, in effect, like, like the bricks. Uh, the construction of this was quite, um, I mean, there was a certain amount of resistance initially. The contractor didn't really, wasn't really familiar with this approach because it had never been done before. Um, and uh, so there was the usual resistance, but ultimately it was pretty um, straightforward and the erection happened quite smoothly and, and everybody was happy about it. The thing that I like about it, um, among other things, is that it created this kind of theatrical performance during the construction where you had these large panels going up and being assembled like a big um, Lego set. And I think that left an impression that is part of the, part of the character of, of, of the building. <coughs> the other aspect was that um, <clears throat> the engineer who was working on, on site, Amy Weinstein, um, had done this drawing to um, track the rebar that went into these um, uh, concrete elements. And she walked around with this, and as they were assembling it, would check whether the rebar in all the vertical and horizontals of these, of these units was correct. Um, I saw this and knew that Stephen had been looking for a, a color scheme to use on the, on the facade, and so um, showed it to him, and they decided um, to go ahead and use that as the basis of the color scheme in the jams and heads of the window. So these colors actually represent the rebar that is inside that piece or that piece and so on, so that you can directly read, if you will, the stress pattern from that, 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 that color scheme um, based on the drawing that, that Amy had done. Inevitably, it being MIT, somebody writes an email and says, well, you know, you're wrong. <laughs> It's a very strange building. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but the scale, the feeling of scale that you get when you look at it uh, from a distance is really kind of unnerving. Um, when you get inside, it's quite a different experience than from the outside. It feels much bigger in a way as you get closer to it. And the inside is wonderful. The concrete of the facade is all left exposed on the inside. It's covered on the outside with insulation and, and aluminum panels. Um, and then the rest of the inside is all exposed concrete, so it's, it's really quite a wonderful um, experience. A couple years later, also with Stephen, we did the Nelson Atkins Museum. Uh, this was a remarkable competition scheme that Stephen did, um, disobeying the competition 
rules, um, which said that the new building was to go here behind the, the old Nelson Atkins Museum, which is itself quite beautiful. Um, Stephen instead strung um, the addition along the side here, facing toward this garden that had been designed by Dan Kiley and, and Jack Robertson, and, and it really very effective um, scheme. It's, it's a wonderful building. It's a series of light monitors that, has, that, that descend down the, the landscape um, lenses, as, as um, Stephen calls them. And then actually, over the space where the building was to have gone, um, there's this large Walter de Maria um, uh, water um, sculpture with a central element representing the sun. Um, it's kind of a spherical surface here, gold plated, uh, gold leaf, I think. And then a lot of holes um, to the structure below, letting light through, representing planets all around it. Quite a beautiful, serene um, piece. And then the, the architecture here, you see the lobby lens, the big entrance lens, um, is all clad in, in, in luminous um, channel glass, double layers of channel glass with the structure inside. And the structure is kept very small by concentrating it all in, in, the, in the middle. And so um, you'll see that in a second. Uh, each of the buildings has a kind of spine holding it up and then cantilever arms that go out to the tip and just stabilize um, the system. <coughs> the garage was also made, like MIT, out of precast concrete. Um, these were what we called wave tees. Uh, we, had, we found a company in Portland to make the form and a very nice precaster in St. Louis that made the, these pieces um, 60 feet long, 12 feet wide. Um, that make up the garage, um, quite heavy, um, but they come together into this. The, so each, each of them is supported by a column, so you don't have any structure going in the other direction. So the corrugation goes clear across the three bays of 60 feet, so it's almost 200 feet in one direction, I think a little over 200 feet in the other direction with this corrugated ceiling, and then the light coming through the holes um, above under the, fount, under the water um, uh, of, of Walter de Maria's piece. And, and when you come in here, you can go directly into that, into the lobby. Um, one of the great things of the space is also that because of the drainage that's required above um, in the landscape, it opens and closes a lot. And so you have this great feeling of expansion and, and compression in that, in that space. Um, there are two levels. The lower level is, is uniform, but the upper level really has a lot of, of variation in it. Um, very effective. Um, now that's, that's the lobby lens under construction in the back there. You can see the truss, which goes down the middle of, of that structure. So it's basically held up in the middle, and then there are arms coming out that are attached to smaller members on the perimeter, which, which stabilize it, but don't carry as much load as, as the middle. That way you get as much of the structure concentrated inside and as little structure as possible within the glass on the, on the perimeter. Um, in, the, in the competition, one of the um, jurors was a man named Brown, as in Brown University, who, who from Rhode Island, who sailed a lot. And um, I had described to Stephen that this was kind of like a mast with, with, with outriggers, um, like uh, on a sailboat. And Stephen did that and gestured that. And, and, and Brown from Rhode Island, big sailor, really liked that idea, uh, just like a sailboat. Uh, it's beautiful in, inside. Um, here you see parts of that truss um, expressed there. Uh, kind of still in this mode of, of precast concrete and the, the kind of energy that comes from that that fabrication at the church in Rome did a couple of years ago with Richard Meyer competition. Um, a little bit like the Phillips Pavilion for Corp, I think this project is quite unique in, in Meyer's um, work. And I, 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 I don't quite know how to account for it, but it really was um, a surprise to all of us when he, he came up with the design during the competition, and it's really quite effective. Um, it's these three spherical shells that are nested into each other that make up the space of the, of the church. And then on the side there is a community center building, which is up against this wall that separates the two. And then there's a glass roof supported on this arch structure, uh, which leans away from that, that back wall. 
The main thing is these, these, these big walls, which um, after some discussion with the engineers, we were able to convince them that they made, made out of large pieces of precast concrete. Um, you know, very Roman in feeling, but also I think, um, and this is I think part of the reason why they liked it, um, reminiscent of, of, of Nervi's um, prefabrication of, of concrete elements. So this idea of pre prefabricating elements and then assembling them in the field um, as a kind of stacking um, process. Now, the company that built it, Ital Cemente, which is a large cement company in, in, in Italy, they came up with the idea of this gantry to, to install it, which was this big um, crane that they built specifically for the project which everybody called La Machina, which went back and forth on rails and installed each of these walls um, block by block. And here you see it nestled around the second of the shells. Here you see it from a distance um, again here. And you can start to see there, these were the blocks. This is sort of at the beginning, three sets of, of rails. So each one allowing it to, to, to go over the, um, the shells one after another. Um, there is a block in place. Um, they would get lifted from the ground and then put into a jig. The jig was um, sitting on a, a um, platform that was uh, um, hydraulically activated, so it actuated so it could move in both directions. This could go up and down. It also had pitch and roll, so it was really fully um, uh, free to position the blocks exactly in the right orientation. It was numerically controlled. Um, to get, you know, program for each one to get placed correctly um, so that there were only three guys operating it. One guy on the machine, one guy here adjusting the, the couplers, um, putting them in one by one. They, the, the space in between was filled with grout and the couplers would tie, sorry, would tie the, um, the vertical bars to each other and, and pre-stress it as it went up. It needed some clamping force to, um, to hold it together. It moved very slowly. It would, they would install one block in the morning, go for lunch, <laughs> come back a little bit later, another block in the afternoon, go home. Um, which worked out for me perfect because it took about three years to build these things and I had to go Rome you know, every four or five months, um, which was fine. But it also meant that, that the, the community around this, um, if you go back, sorry, to this, um, you can sort of see that these are housing on either side here of the church. The community around us watched this big crane go back and forth every day for three years, moving these blocks, slowly building this thing one at a time. And, you know, kids grew up watching this thing happen. So I think it, it is another case where the history of the project's construction becomes embedded in the, in the character. This is a view from the inside. See these very large cutouts in the wall. So these things have to span quite a distance. So they're, they're post-tension vertically and horizontally to, to hold them um, together. And they really do lean quite a, quite a ways over, over your head. Now, you know, in this theme of vortex, one of the things that, that came out of this project was completely unexpected was um, Meyer wasn't particularly excited about the idea of cast in place concrete being left exposed. It, he, he wasn't convinced that it was going to be consistent and, and smooth enough and abstract enough in, in feeling. So he put a lot of pressure on the, on the fabricator and the cement company to come up with an extremely white concrete. They experimented a lot and in the end they found a way to do that by adding titanium dioxide to the cement. And this was the first time anyone had really done that in a project. I think they'd done it in the lab, but never before on a real project. It did produce a very white cement, and everybody was happy about that. But it also produced a cement that shed water, which was unexpected. And so it turned out that the concrete um, surface would actually collect um, dirt from the atmosphere, um, soot and, and smog. It would hold it on the surface, and then when it rained, it would wash off. It wouldn't stay, it wouldn't stay in the concrete. And so it was actually helping with um, cleaning the atmosphere. And so it's now sold widely by this company as the solution to um, global warming. <laughs> All because Meyer wanted white. Um, here also you can see the, the, the joining. Um, 
the horizontal joints are on great circles, but the vertical joints are on vertical planes, which means that each of these pieces is, is quite different <coughs> from the one next to it. But it also means that this doesn't look like a billowing sail. It really looks like a more abstract um, form. <coughs> and that's the, um, the description of that, of that discovery. Uh, this is a competition project in, in Washington um, we did with um, Harry Cobb, the courtyard for the Patent Office building, which used to have two big trees in it, which were cut when they built a new um, basement. Our project had trees um, to hold up the new roof um, to cre recreate that spatial feeling that those trees um, had, had given, and then a roof structure which was based on the two-way moment diagram on the grid, a horizontal grid, uh, using pipes to create that, um, that waveform that would have cables in them so that you could post-tension the cables under uh, the, um, when you initially built it, and that cable would, in effect, balance the weight of, of the roof, and that central grid would all be in, in compression. So, this, this kind of um, um, bubbling cauldron of, of, of things up here are the, the moment diagram, which would be ducts for cables, which would balance the, the load and give you, and gave you that, that appearance um, there. Um, but we didn't win. Foster did and, won and, and built a really nice, I think one of his best um, projects. This is a Toledo Museum of, of Glass, and, and this starts to go, um, in a way, a little bit like the MoMA project towards projects that are um, interesting through their invisibility, in a sense. Uh, uh, in this case, I think, appropriately enough, because if you think about the initial partie of, of Sana, um, I remember when I saw this drawing the first time, I thought it was a bubble diagram representing the, the, the program, and in fact, it was the architecture, and I think the ambiguity between that abstraction of the program and the line and the thinness of the line and how the final architecture actually embodies that thinness is a big part of their, their success. And when you go in here and walk around, you really can't tell um, walking around this where the structure is. Um, it was very important to Sana that it be very thin, and to achieve that we use a kind of, of continuous grid of steel in both directions, everything rigidly connected to everything else. So if you push down somewhere here, it ripples through the whole um, surface. Everything is, 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 is interlinked. All these connections that you see here along that, the, the, the dark stuff here, those are all rigid connections for each beam. They're eight feet apart, and then the girder is running in the other direction, um, all of which to achieve about a 12 inch thickness of, of steel. Overall, I think it's about 21 inches with everything included. Um, and then everything integrated and woven inside that, that grid. So all the piping, um, et cetera. And then a lot of effort, even taking into account the bolts and the plates and everything else to make sure that the glass would pass by and not bump into that. So very, very tight tolerances on this, on this project. And then the columns, are, are three inches in diameter, solid steel, and they're kind of scattered somewhat randomly in the plan, so in effect you can't really tell um, the organization of that, of that structure. The, the, the longest span is um, from here to there is about 60 feet, which is achieved with 12 inches, so it's, it's, it's pretty significant um, pieces of steel. This is a project with Michael Maltzen a couple years ago for a, um, a museum in Fresno. The building lifted up off the, off the ground, and then above that, again, a grid system of trusses in this case that's floating above the ground to hold that, um, <clears throat> to hold that up. And then an a administration building for the Jet Propulsion Lab, um, which has, a, again, an intersecting system of, of, of gridded system with truss elements, the red things that you see here, scattered somewhat randomly through that to create the lateral system for seismic, 
but also to have this kind of um, scatter diagram of, 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 of the structure. This is a model that we did representing the flow of forces uh, for an exhibition that, that Michael had um, in the structure. Um, a couple years ago, we, we did a bridge at, at Yale, also in this kind of theme of, of, of thinness. This is made of steel plate, quarter inch thick, that is perforated and corrugated um, along the length. It's, it's a similar situation to Crown Hall, where the, the structure is, is standing up from the, the deck, and so the problem is how to stabilize that top flange and keep it from, from buckling over to the side. In this case, we did it by virtue of the corrugation. And so the, the corrugation, this is the precedent. Um, the client for this project was very interested in Victorian structures and so wanted something that was progressive but also had that, that quality um, as well. So the corrugation, <coughs> this is a Virendale. It, it works as a Virendale because of the, of the perforation. But the corrugation you can see is, is greater in the middle here where it's, it's stabilizing the top flange where the compression is high and then greater again on the ends where the shear is high and you have the possibility of the web buckling. And so you get that variation that is um, related to the, 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 the structural performance. Building it was tricky and the tolerances were very hard to achieve because of the thinness of, of the plate because when you welded it, it moved, and so Steve Horn, the fabricator, um, had to actually started by building a full mock-up um, available if you'd like to have one in your backyard um, that um, he used to get used to the controls that he had to apply to, to keep the welding from distorting things too much. Um, that's it being erected. Um, now, this, this leads up to my last um, section, which, which Beth alluded to is this, the work that we've been doing around climate change. Um, we did a project um, a little while after 9-11 for a, a uh, broadcast tower that uh, we proposed to locate at the end of the Bayonne Pier. Um, this was while there was still a fair amount of contention about what was going to happen at Ground Zero. And there was a possibility that the, um, the TV antennas might not end up on top of the building at ground zero. And so this was an alternative location for, for TV antennas. In the process of doing this, it led us to start to think about this as a place um, in the city. And so I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later. The tower was um, an idea that we um, developed, again, with Harry Cobb. Um, shortly after 9-11, a year after, for a publication in the New York Times magazine that was organized by Herbert Mouchamp to, to produce a whole series of ideas um, to try to open up the debate on what to do with Ground Zero. Um, Harry and I worked on this tower, which was going to go at, um, at um, Wall Street, which um, we based on, on having seven vertical um, uh, stems, we call them, going up in different ways, bypassing each other, so following paths where they don't collide with each other, but they sort of interlace, sort of like twirled um, spaghetti um, going up, and then linked um, every 70 feet by a series of, of, of beams. And so the beams tie the, the stems together and turn this into a vertical virendale. One of the ideas here was that they never close, and so the, the, the way in which it's tied together becomes a kind of ideographic um, figure as you, as you go across. So always an open, open um, form as you move across, but always eventually capturing all of the stems and holding them um, together. Now, when we were developing the project, um, so initially it was for, in the, in the magazine, it was for Wall Street. Um, we then came back and proposed to the Port Authority that this be considered and so worked with them and a developer on this um, for the site at Bayon Pier. And we discovered with a colleague, Ted Zoli, um, that we could use some work that had been done on the drag of, of paired cylinders. So um, 
this is a study that was done to see what happens if you have two cylinders. Let's say you've got hanger cables and a bridge. If they're at some distance apart, you can sometimes get problems because one is in the wake of the other and it starts to vibrate because of the, the effects of that wake. And so they've done a lot of studies to see what's the optimal position. Well, if they're close together, one is kind of hiding behind the other. If they're far apart, um, they're more or less independent. What they discovered was if they're, they're at a certain distance from each other, it turns out, and this is paradoxical, that the drag on two is less than the drag on one. So far apart, you know, one plus one equals two. Right next to each other, one plus one equals one. But if they're three diameters apart, one plus one is less than one, which is surprising. And so that led us to think how we could arrange our stems in such a way that we might be able to minimize the drag relative to the maximum direction of wind, which is north, um, northeast, uh, northeast and north, northwest. So we did these fluid dynamic studies um, to look at different ways of positioning them so that the group drag was minimized in that particular direction. And so what we did was develop what we called a, a drag rose, which would be oriented opposite to the, uh, to the direction of maximum wind. <clears throat> in effect, the structure would, a little bit like the World Trade Center Tower, be a representation of the, of the wind environment um, around it. Um, a couple of years later, that idea um, sort of stuck um, in the back of our mind and, and um, uh, the dean at, at my school, Stan Allen, asked me to apply for a grant um, that's given by the AIA. And my wife, Catherine, and I started thinking what we could apply for. And we didn't really have any clear idea. And in discussion, we, we remembered you know, working on that tower and the fact that this place was kind of an interesting figure. Um, looks to me like a sort of Dr. Seuss head. Um, and and a place, you know, growing up in New York, which had never really been in, in my consciousness and I didn't think was very much in other people's consciousness as well. So we thought of the idea of taking this as our site and addressing um, the question of climate change and particular sea level rise and see if there was a way to, to, to propose a, a design for adaptation to sea level rise that would also have the effect of turning this place into a significant difference in terms of flooding, say, back to you know, this line here, which represents category three or four hurricane, you know, where now that might occur once every 100 years. If the water level is higher, it's going to start happening more every 30 years, and so on. So flood risks is exacerbated by the, the sea level rise. And so the problem then becomes, how do you protect <coughs> the city from these more frequent and more damaging storm surges. Well, one idea is to build gates, um, and there is a serious proposal on the table to do that, which would basically block the water from the inner harbor where it comes in. Um, doesn't do much for everybody else, but it does um, protect um, Manhattan. Um, and that's basically the Dutch approach, and that means you build these very large infrastructure, hard infrastructure solutions to just keep storm surge out. Um, but you know, to do that, you need a lot of money, and you need a lot of coordinated planning, because you need the wall really to extend, you know, like in Holland, the full length of, of the coast. Um, our suggestion was to rather take an approach that, that um, was softer, where we put obstacles in the way of the storm surge and try to dissipate the energy um, by that means, kind of like wetlands. Um, and mangroves do um, in southern um, uh, regions. And so building islands, building um, uh, oyster racks or small islands and so on, creating obstacles in the way of the storm, but at the same time creating a place. And the metaphor we used was that, in effect, we were proposing something that was analogous to what Olmsted and Vox proposed with, with Central Park a new void in the center of the region that would be a kind of organizing principle for, for the region as a whole. Uh, and if you look at old drawings of Central Park, it was a void within a void before it became a void within the city, and the same holds for our proposal. The idea that the water can be a place was also part of this, and I think 
Um, you know, there are many examples of where that's the case, but not something that was familiar in, in New York. So I'll go through this quickly. The research involved a lot of work by students uh, mapping the boundary around the, the mapping the, the variation in the boundary historically, pointing out the fact that it really is a dynamic edge, not something that is static, going into quite a lot of detail um, from aerial photographs to um, sorry, to go um, here we go across, um, so you can see here along the top there, so going, going and closely looking at the edge and mapping the height and nature of those edges to see um, what was there now to include in a, in a model that we, we built of the, of the harbor. So this is a bathymetric model representing the topography of the underwater landscape and then combined with the topographic model becomes the basis for numerical analyses of, of the water. We also have information from earlier research that we did on the building inventory um, so we could superimpose flooding situations with building inventory and start to look at, at the consequences of, of floods. And then experiment in a fluid dynamic program with the, the, the consequences of building islands. You know, what does that do both to the flow but also to the flooding um, in that place? And so we did some preliminary studies, and there's a lot of work left to do here, but the preliminary studies looking at, at what islands would do for you and um, with a colleague who's now at MIT, she developed a hurricane for us and um, working with National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Institute, we, we did this um, simulation which showed that even though the amount of water, the storm surge height, would be the same with and without our islands, the velocity of the water would be reduced. So the energy of the storm surge would be, would be reduced, which is the idea. Lots of ideas about transportation and other urban design notions came into play. Some whimsical proposals. Um, we, 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 sell, we, we, we ship our old subway cars to other states for use as reefs. Um, we could use them ourselves. Um, new islands that could replace the wetlands that will be submerged by the sea level rise. And then this <coughs> very beautiful, I think, proposal that um, Architecture Research Office did for what the lower part of Manhattan might look like following this kind of, of, of approach. Um, building islands out of dredge material, and we actually have a project right now with the Port Authority looking at this specifically, um, so they're interested in that. You know, it's, it's a good way to reuse dredge material rather than shipping it to some faraway place. Um, studying island and, and fluid flow as a, as a, as a form-giving device. I mean, the, the studies that ARO did um, on the water table were really um, instrumental in the, in the design of the islands um, as well. Finally, we did a project um, um, parallel to this for the Mississippi um, Delta for the Biennale last year, which uh, involved ultimately building parallel models of, of lower Manhattan, um, the, our, our project for, for the bay here and, and the Mississippi Delta and representing the relationship between the water and the land and the bathymetry as this separation. So objectifying the water and building it as, as an object floating above the topography, exaggerating the vertical dimension, and you know, again, trying to raise awareness about this, this, this dynamic relationship between the water and the land. This is the model that the students at, MIT, at Princeton got MIT on the brain. Um, uh, the students at Princeton um, built for that. Um, here are some of the details of that. There's our Bayonne Pier, where our tower will go someday, um, and more detail of that. And then the water um, floating above this. My wife, Catherine um, Sievit, um, oversaw the building of this model um, with the students. Um, and then on the, um, here's some more detail of that. And then on the Mississippi side, we worked with Louisiana State University on a proposal that one of their faculty, Bob Twilley, had come up with of rebuilding land in the, in the estuary by diverting water from the Atchafalaya and, and Mississippi into these five different diversions and representing that idea. Again, the dynamic character of, of water and land. Um, this is an old map of all the, 
channels of the Mississippi, um, trying to find a way to deal again with sea level rise, but also storm surge. Um, this is the infrastructure around the, the delta. Um, by going across here and looking at ways that the water and the sediment could be channeled and the sediment, particularly in flood um, situations, the sediment brought out and used to rebuild land um, in different parts of, of the delta. So we represented that as well in that, in that exhibition at, at, um, in Venice. Um, and then really proposed a very specific um, uh, uh, plumbing diagram, if you will, of, of where you know, the diversion here at the Old River structures now is by law 30% Atchafalaya, 70% uh, Mississippi. If, if, if you read John McPhee's book, for example, on this, it gives you a good account of this. Um, this is in order to keep the Mississippi from going where it wants to go, which is here. If you left things alone, the Mississippi would move to the Atchafalaya line, um, but then, of course, all the shipping would, would be disrupted. And so continuing this um, river control uh, regime, but, but, but transforming it into what Bob Tuley calls controlled flooding. So using a broader range of channels to get water into more places and sediment into more places to rebuild um, the delta. And that, that's what this all represents. Um, uh, and then the model that we built this now for the Mississippi Delta, showing you know, the, the tragedy of the fact that, that all that sediment is going out and dumping off the continental shelf here instead of being used to, to rebuild the land as, as, as historically it, it did. Beautiful landscape. Um, thank you. Can I take a few questions? Sure. Uh, we can accept a few questions if anyone has any. My experience is that, that um, when you find people that you like to work with, uh, and it's you know it's just chemistry, um, that you 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 stick with it, and that what you find is that that it's the accumulation and the repetition of projects and situations that builds the levels of communication that are that make it possible to try things that are. are Riskier. It also builds the trust. Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of what gets done in architecture and engineering is is a, 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 a management of risk, and that um, you know it's harder on your own to identify and manage risk than it is with others. And so, just as if you went climbing, you go with someone else attached, you know, to each other. <coughs> you want to find that same kind of, of, of partnership. It can be with an engineer, it can be with another architect, it can be with a builder. You know, there's a lot of interesting, I mean, if you look at the history of Frank Lloyd Wright, he had some very interesting relationships with builders. Um, so in, in the end, it's you, you, you build a network. Um, and you know, I, there, there are people that I've done work with, fabricators or craftsmen, you know, for, for many, many years, and we know each other's idiosyncrasies, um, and we depend on each other you know, for, for business and for the ability to get certain things done. And then you're, you know, you're, it's a bit like the Menil project. You're sitting down with a group of people and figuring out, um, you know, what if we were to try this thing? Do we, do we think we can pull it off? And so calibrating that um, as well. And I think that, you know, you, in school you find the other architects with whom partner to make those sort of judgments, and then ultimately you'll find the builders and craftsmen. But, but building relationships, and, and, and that means treating people well. 
one of the problems in architecture is that not everyone always treats their people well, um, and uh, which is unfortunate because then you know it becomes a business and, and everybody's out to maximize their opportunity in one project. Um, you lose that continuity and you lose that um, that trust. And, and I think you know to some extent the the glorification of the individual <coughs> and often, you know, can be an engineer like Calatrava or an architect or, or whoever, um, that's a distortion that, that's, that works against um, what I'm describing. Well, earthquakes, for example, uh, and, and I, I, it's a really one of the reasons that I'm interested in flooding is um, I used to do a lot of earthquake engineering work, and you know, in, in earthquakes are completely uncertain. I mean, it goes back to the risk question. Earthquakes are completely uncertain. You, you, you don't know the individual characteristic of each earthquake. So if you're trying to design to survive an earthquake, you're designing to survive something which is random. In fact, the random in, 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 in magnitude and random in, in characteristics. The, the genius of the early, uh, the folks that, that started the field of earthquake engineering in the 40s and 50s was that they realized that the way to deal with that uncertainty is to design filters so that if you, if you designed a structure so that everything was tied together and the connections were all very robust and were capable of distorting and bending and accepting lots of damage without falling apart. You know, so in a concrete column, the way to do that is you have very tightly spaced horizontal hoops, like barrel staves, holding the concrete and the steel together. Little things like that mean that if that had to go through an earthquake, it would hang together and it would hold the concrete inside the very tightly spaced spirals. The benefit of that was that you then had a structure which had enough um, ability to absorb damage that you didn't really need to know exactly what the earthquake was going to be like. So if you got it, off, got it wrong by a factor of two, <coughs> you were okay. So that was one thing which, you know, the general thing is ductility. But the idea of that, you know, the idea of, of making something crash resistant that way um, was a breakthrough. Because it wasn't just designing to the, to the actual specific load, it was designing to something uncertain and filtering out that uncertainty. Um, and I, I'm really interested to figure out how you do that with storms. You know, it's a similar, you know, energy dissipation is another way of talking about it. But I think, um, you know, in design, in engineering design, and it's true in any, I mean, whether you're designing computers or anything. You know, it's one thing to design to a specific need, but the thing that's even more interesting is designing for uncertainty and designing in an economical way for the unknown. You know, and that's where it becomes you know, something that everybody can contribute to because it's, it's so conceptual. structures that it really do change 
one of the fundamental differences between an engineering solution to flooding, for example, which says, you know, the water's going to reach here, so I'm going to build my wall to there. And then, sure enough, the water goes to here, right? We saw it in Japan. Um, you know, and that was a system, I mean, the, the flood protection in Japan was a system that was not designed for uncertainty. You know, it was designed for certainty, and they got it wrong. So if you, um, if you go that route, you, 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 you invest huge amounts of money in something that's hard and fixed. You know, and, and even like in, in New Orleans, you know, they, they, they incrementally, the Corps of Engineers incrementally builds up the levees, but they're building it up in an incremental way that's really not stable. So if you make something, an island or, or something that is organic, you can get it wrong and adapt more easily. You know, the sea level, you might predict a meter and it's more than a meter. Well, okay, so you pile on more stuff. Um, so intrinsic in that design is that ability to, to, to adjust to um, errors in your, in, in your prediction. Um, it also means that, you know, one of my favorite things is the, have you ever heard of the white horse in, in England? Um, there's a thing called a ridgeway, which is one of the oldest um, roads, if you will, 5,000 years old, which goes from southwest England to south of Oxford and to the, to the, to the north um, east. And it's where the early settlers, megalithic settlers of, of British Isle Island um, migrated from landing up into the land. And the reason they would follow this was it's on this chalk down and the water, it was very thin topsoil, and the water would flow down on the chalk and away from the top. And so there was never any water there, so there were never any animals. So you could camp on the, on the hill and the animals wouldn't come and, and, and devour you. Uh, so this was safe and it was also continuous. So you could basically travel on this camp and continue, go down for water, come back to camp. And it's been like this for 5,000 years and it's still used. It's called the Ridgeway. All along the Ridgeway, there are all these old megalithic structures, tombs, mounds, forts, you know, which are like earthworks. Um, Stonehenge is near there. The Avebury Circle of Stones is near there. Well, one of the features is something called the White Horse, which is this beautiful abstract figure of a horse that you can only see from a distance and actually pretty much only from the air, which is, which is on the side of one of these hills and is, it was made by simply scratching the topsoil off and revealing the white chalk. It's been there for 5,000 years, and the people in the village near it go and clean it. And they've been cleaning it for 5,000 years. So if you can, if you can you know, make infrastructure like that, you know, if you can deal with climate change and situations like, like, that you have to adapt to like that, then it's, you know, it's a living cultural thing, you know, like the Dutch polders, basically. Um, and that, I think that, that's part of the ob objective and, and, and another way of dealing with uncertainty. So I think if along with those kinds of organic solution comes a cultural solution, then you've got something. Sorry? Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. All. Thank you. I